One of the most common arguments we have in safety is about the usefulness of models. On the one hand, we have people suggesting that models are unnecessarily complex or too theoretical or don't really give true insight into safety as it's practiced. On the other hand, we have people who wield models as an insult, accusing other people of linear reductionist thinking. Now, it's very easy to get smug here and to think, well, that doesn't apply to me. I'm not one of these linear reductionist thinkers. But when they talk about linear reductionism, they're talking about your thinking. They're talking about my thinking. In fact, we're all at various times guilty of being reductionist. That's really the only way to survive as a human in the real world is to sometimes simplify. The question is, when is that simplification appropriate and useful? And when is it misleading? So today we're going to be talking about a particular type of simplification, the application of barrier models to safety. Now let's start with a concept that might seem fairly straightforward. What does it mean for something to cause something else? We have a cause, we have an accident. Seems fairly straightforward. Until you ask yourself, what does that accident, act, what does that arrow actually mean? Um, is it something statistical? Is it something mathematical? Is it something physically determined? Believe it or not, the idea of simple causality is something that has caused philosophers of science and statisticians considerable angst for many years. Because it turns out there is no universal or objective meaning of the idea for something to cause something else. In fact, as best we can tell from psychological studies of people's understanding of causality, to say that something causes something else is really simply a human construction. If you want to create an AI that is able to solve that problem of identifying causes, you don't program it to mimic the real world causality. You program it to try to identify things that match human understanding of cause. So one of the most simple meanings of the arrow is simply the passage of time. We usually presume that cause precedes effect. So for A to cause B suggests that A happens and then B happens. The cause happens, then the accident happens. The driver of the car failed to apply the brakes and then the car hit the car in front of it. Now, usually we mean something a little bit deeper than that because we don't just accept always that something happening before something else is a cause. We might consider that to be coincidence or if it happens a lot of times, correlation without necessarily being cause. So the next test that we tend to apply is something called counterfactuals. A counterfactual says that something causes something else if stopping the first thing stops the consequence. So if not for the fact that the driver failed to apply the brakes, then the cars wouldn't have hit each other. If not for the match, there wouldn't have been a spark. If not for the spark, there wouldn't have been a fire. If not for the provision of fuel and oxygen, the fire would not have continued. That's a counterfactual. No cause, no accident. Now, that's fairly rough. That doesn't cover most of what we want to think of as causes either. Because oftentimes, the accident might still have happened even without the cause. So what we really mean is some sort of probabilistic counterfactual. The existence of the cause increased the probability of the accident. If not for the cause, the accident may still have happened, but it would have been less likely, or at least would have happened in a different way. But even probabilistic counterfactuals don't capture the full idea of what we think of as causes. Take this little list of factors associated with a particular accident. I've taken them from a real accident, and it's quite possible that if you eliminated any one of these factors, that the accident would not have happened. Certainly changing any of these factors would have changed the likelihood of the accident, either up or down. But which ones of these would we accept as causes? 
Now, I'm willing to bet as you're reading through the list, you're going to say, it depends. Tell me more about the accident. And that's the precise thing. Because if cause was an objective thing, then simply the knowledge that these things increased or decreased the probability of an accident automatically makes them causes. But you're seeking for some sort of relevance, some sort of narrative in which the connection makes sense. And suddenly cause becomes something that is very socially constructed. So how does this play out when we want to talk about accident models? Well, we've started with a very simple one, cause, consequence. Pretty rough as a model, so let's expand it out and suggest that there are, there are in fact chains of causes. We start with an early cause, it causes something else, it causes something else right before the accident, what we might call a proximal cause, and then the accident happens. Now, once we create a chain like this, then the statistical impact of the early causes actually gets weaker. Changing the probability of the proximal cause very directly changes the probability of the accident. But as we move back in time, the probabilistic link becomes much weaker. And changing the early cause may not in fact change the likelihood of the accident at all. Does this make sense? Are the earlier causes actually less important? Well, statistically speaking, and for preventing this precise accident, yes, indeed. Hold that thought though. Let's expand the model out a little bit further. And let's recognise that in fact, everything doesn't just have one cause, it has multiple causes. So we draw something like this. The early causes now contribute to the accident, but they aren't necessary, they just make the proximal causes more likely. If those causes weren't there, then other things might still have caused the proximal causes. But this makes it clear that in fact, yes, if you want to prevent the accident and you want to be very certain about preventing the accident, then the place to address are those causes which come immediately before the accident. Those things which are most directly and most physically connected are in fact the place to intervene when you set up the model to look like this. But let's turn it round. We could equally well do this and say that we're not interested in stopping the exact same incident, accident or incident. We're interested in stopping all similar accidents. Now for that purpose, the causal network fans out in the other direction. Each accident has many early causes, but equally well, each early cause has many accidents. Now, suddenly it makes sense to start thinking about these early causes. Simple change in the model from fanning it this way to fanning it that way changes where we focus our attention. Now, why would you bother interfering with the causes immediately before the accident? because each one of those could only close off one particular occurrence of that accident, one particular type, and in its most extreme case could only prevent the accident that's already happened and nothing similar. Whereas preventing the early cause, this one feeds into lots of proximal causes and allows us to reduce the probability of many, many similar accidents. So models have a real world effect but also, these models have big drawbacks when it comes to the reductionist assumptions that they're making. You see, every single one of these models we've prevent, presented so far is what we talk about when we talk about a linear model. So what makes a model linear? The strict definition is it has to do with whether a change in the probability of one of the causes has a directly proportional effect when it comes to the next causes and the consequences. Now, that non-proportionality is a little bit hard to think about. But in fact, in the real world, non-linearity comes about almost always because of one particular thing, and that's feedback. A model that has feedback in it is almost guaranteed to be non-linear. And it is in fact the existence of feedback which is the problem with linear models, that they don't take it into account. And by not taking it into account, 
they miss out on so much that is relevant for both understanding and preventing accidents. And it's not just the complex accidents either. You don't need an accident with lots and lots of technology or lots and lots of diverse causal factors to have feedback and therefore non-linearity. Let's go to the real traditional doozy, tripping over something on the ground. Even a person tripping over is a non-linear system. What causes you to trip? It might be the obstacle, it might be your speed, it might be how carefully you're looking at the ground, it might be your shoes, it might be what other tasks are you performing. Okay, so far, it's a linear model. We can expand out the categories of causes we're looking at. We can look at organisational causes, physical causes, human factors causes, psychological causes. We're still being linear. But what does tripping over cause? Do you, as a result of tripping over, move the rock that you tripped over? Do you walk more slowly or more carefully in the future? Do you wear different shoes next time? Does your organisation do something in response? Suddenly now, cause is working in both directions. The causes cause the accident, but the accident causes the causes. And suddenly those old linear models are not able to cope with or explain how accidents still go on to happen. Now, we can see this in more detail when we actually look at some of the very specific linear models we use. So this particular one, I'm almost certain you've seen before. It's a version of one of the most well-known diagrams in safety, known as the Swiss cheese model, or more accurately as the Swiss cheese metaphor, because it really is a metaphor rather than something that gives us explanations. And like most metaphors, it's there to explain and to communicate a very important point. And the very important point that it explains is that accidents are the result of a causal chain, not just a single cause. The reason that James Reason proposed this metaphor, and the reason he felt that this point was necessary, is because the, the cause that is most often proximate, the cause that comes just before the accident, is almost always some sort of human behaviour. When it's a human that gets hurt, when we have systems that have humans, then the very, very last thing that happens is the human doesn't avoid the danger. So if you only look for single causes, and you look for those causes which are most salient, those causes that are most obvious in the moment, those causes which, if prevented, would most certainly have prevented the accident, then almost all of the time, you're going to end up with some sort of human action. And Reason's point was that by tracing backwards in the causal chain, these things are also important. That if we want to understand why a human was in that position, then we need to look at the preconditions. We need to look at the supervision. We need to look at the technology. We need to look at the organisation. So it's an important point that the metaphor is making, but it's only one point. It's a point that moves us from this model cause accident to this model. Not actually that big an improvement when it comes to understanding accidents. Certainly not a move away from linear thinking. Certainly not a move to recognise that causes combine in interesting ways. So the Swiss cheese model certainly doesn't help us understand this one. Um, let alone this one to actually stop and think about what the arrow means in terms of causal relations. And the one thing it completely misses out is once we add in feedback. Putting in feedback just messes up the entire picture. Now this is something that Reason himself struggled with because he recognised that the model that he was providing did not in fact give reasons why those barriers those are missing, why those slices of cheese have holes, or why the holes might line up all at once. He recognised that those causes exist, that there need to be explanations for those things, but he also recognised that the model itself was not capable of providing or 
elucidating or even explaining those explanations to other people. So the Swiss cheese model says the accident happened like this. But you take a step back and say, well, why? Why did the holes line up? Why did the barriers have holes? Why did no one recognise that the barriers had holes? Why didn't someone recognise when a couple of the holes lined up and do something about it? These are all actually the really interesting questions we need to explain and stop the accident. And the model gives us no insight at all. At best, it prompts us to ask those questions, but usually it doesn't. Usually, in fact, it encourages us to think that we now understand the explanation. Well, guys, all the holes lined up today, as if it's some fatalistic tragedy, that this is something that would happen rarely, that you would not expect the holes to line up. And we know that those things aren't true. We know that holes don't line up randomly. We know that, in fact, failures of one barrier can cause failures in another. We know that failure to recognise weaknesses in the barriers is missing feedback within a system. And the model doesn't give us those things. So why is it that we are so attracted to these linear barrier models of safety? We can go back to a guy called Haddon back in 1961. And Haddon proposed that we shift from thinking about causes as nebulous things to affect populations to thinking instead about the actual mechanisms by which accidents come about. Now, according to Haddon, almost all accident mechanisms involve energy or a dangerous substance coming into contact with a human. Accident mechanisms, therefore, can be thwarted by controlling that interface. We can try to control the energy, we can try to control the human, or we can get the human and the energy as far away from each other as possible. Now, Haddon's suggestion, and this is where I think the barrier models are most useful, is to use this understanding to start controlling the energy. We're going to look now at another barrier model that I think is slightly more useful than the Swiss cheese. It's used a lot in the energy and gas and sometimes in the nuclear sectors. It's called layers of protection analysis. We start off as looking at the energy itself. So our first defence when we're worried about energy being in contact with humans is to reduce the amount of energy in the system. If it doesn't need to be there, then why is it? And the best thing we can do for safety is simply reduce the potential. Next thing we can do after we've considered the energy itself is to put the energy under control. So take for example my car. My car has a lot of kinetic energy, and the first thing I can do is simply slow down. If I reduce the amount of kinetic energy in the system, I reduce the potential for harm. But the next type of protection I have is to simply prevent that energy getting under control, to make sure that normal operations of the car never get to the point where we need any other sort of protection. If the car can't be fully controlled, then next thing we want to do is detect and alarm. So these are our automatic sensors, our warnings in process power plants. In my car, it's a little thing that beep beep beeps when I try to stray out a lane, or another flashing red light that happens when I get too close to the car in front. It's still providing some sort of control because it's requiring the human to respond. So the next layer of protection that we build in is we put in place automated safety. So this is where when I fail to slow down, the car puts on the brakes for me. In a process plant, it might be going into some sort of safe shutdown mode if the operators fail to take action for the alarms. On top of the automated safety, we allow the possibility that that's not enough to prevent the harm. So we build around it physical containment. So in my car, these are the crumple zones. This is the making sure that the energy still can't get in contact with the human, even after all control has been lost. In a chemical process plant, this is where we put in place shielding. This is the reason that despite all of the controls, the alarms, the scram systems on nuclear reactors, they still think, stick the whole things into massive concrete shells, recognising that that's the last defence for the energy getting out. 
Beyond this point, we still have barriers, but they stop being quite so literal. And we talk about things like emergency response. But can you see that once we get beyond that point, we're really not talking about control of the energy any anymore. This is the point at which we're starting to talk about metaphorical barriers. And this is the point where barrier models start to lose their influence. So to some extent, the barrier model is helping us expand our thinking about safety. It's starting with a clear model for what's happening, which is energy, contact with people. And it's saying that the role of safety is to get in the middle. It gets you away from a very naive response to that by providing a whole selection of different ways you can get in the middle. And it's most useful when it's dealing with those physical protections, those accident mechanisms. But as well as expanding your thinking in this way, it's also constraining thinking. The limitations of a barrier model are that they focus on the exceptional, not on the normal. We've talked about the different types of barriers in place, and only a couple of those barriers were actually to do with how do you actually manage the energy well. It encourages you to think of things going out of control, but doesn't encourage you to think of how to keep control. All of those features of my car that help me to drive it well, good visibility, good mirrors, good handling, all of these things are not really considered in the barrier model that thinks of what goes wrong. It also only works for hazards that you've already thought about. So it doesn't do any good at all at protecting when you don't know what it is you're protecting against. Barriers require you to know what the energy is, they require you to know how it behaves, and in fact, they can restrict the versatility of the system when it comes to other types of hazards that you haven't thought of. And then the final problem is that they don't really give insight into barrier failure. They don't really stop and think, well, okay, if the system really did work like this, if we really did understand what the energy was, what the barriers are, and we could explain accidents completely in terms of barrier failure, then why do we still need to explain accidents? The very fact that you can explain an accident in terms of the failure of barriers and not enough barriers says clearly that there is something else going on that the barriers can't explain. And it's that extra element that why is this explanation not enough in itself to prevent the accidents that we need if we're going to model accidents in a way that is actually useful for understanding how accidents happen and how to improve safety.